Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the future of payments. My name is Pierre Meyer, and uh, along with Stefan, we've been working in the field for a while now, which is why we decided to create this group, this meetup, for people in the industry like you to know each other, to learn from each other, whether you're interested in billing, in payment, in POS system, or simply e-commerce in general. We are actively looking for sponsors or uh, speakers, so if you want to help us, please find us afterwards. We have a great agenda for you tonight. First of all, Martin Westhead, Director, Global Payments at Groupon, will talk to us about the challenges Groupon faces and also go over the history of the Kill Bill project since he has actually been involved with the project since day one, long time before Groupon. Then uh, Stefan will talk to you about the Killbo project in general. We'll go in um, more detail how Groupon uses it. And uh, we'll leave some time for Q&A, and then we can, we can mingle here for a while and uh, eat the leftover falafels. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Groupon for having us tonight. And uh, particularly Diana, Casey, and Elena, who put us the food and the drinks together. Let's, be, let's give them a big round of applause. Um, maybe before we begin, we'd like to understand a little bit more uh, who's in the audience. So raise your hand if you are an engineer. Wow. All right, All right. 99%. PM, product, two, three. All right. Uh, analytics, finance, CFOs. Two-ish, three. <laughs> uh, and who is working in, uh, in the payment industry? All right, about half of it. Great. Martin, take it away. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, how do I? <coughs> OK, so. <clears throat> I only really have two topics here. The first one is um, to tell you a little bit about some of the challenges that we have a group on around payments. Um, so this is uh, um, this is mostly the stuff. Well, all the things I'm going to talk about are a part of my organisation. So um, there are really three areas that I'm responsible for a group on. Uh, the first is global payments. Uh, this is all engineering, by the way. I'm responsible for the engineering for these features. So the first is global payments, which is um, customers paying Groupon for Groupons. Um, we operate in 49 different countries. We have something like 60 different payment integrations in those different countries. And uh, we are in the process of unifying our technology around Kill Bill to provide um, a, a consistent technology stack for those integrations. Um, the second piece that I'm responsible for is merchant payments. So um, that's the team, there's a few of them in the audience here, that are um, based in the office here in San Francisco. And uh, they're responsible for providing a payments as a service for merchants. Um, so we, we support uh, card present and card not present uh, credit card payments. And um, a, a, yeah, a couple of other sort of peripheral features and payment methods. Um, and the, the main focus of that payment support is for our point-of-sale systems. So we actually have two point-of-sale systems. Um, this one is uh, the, uh, the, the primary one. It's uh, a point-of-sale targeted at uh, high-end restaurants and bars. Um, we also have a point-of-sale system that uh, is more generic. And... Um, targeted on a, you know, a, a broader set of, um, of vertical users. Okay, that's payments and point of sale group on. Um, or at least those are the pieces that I own. Uh, any questions or... Not right now. Is a question? No? Um, incidentally, Kill Bill is going to be used for the point of sale system. We're, we're currently on the process of uh, replacing a third-party subscription billing engine with Kill Bill to provide subscriptions for this. Um, okay, so 
The next part of what I'm going to talk about is Kill Bill. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why we found ourselves in the position where it made sense to build our own billing system. Uh, so I don't know if anybody here has heard of a, a product called Ning. It was a Mark Andreessen social network startup. Uh, it started out as a free product and um, was very successful in, in growing rapidly. Um, but we hit a few speed bumps along the way, and um, we reached a point where it was clear that we needed to uh, figure out what the right business model is. And um, after trying a number of different alternatives, uh, the team decided that the, 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 uh, where we were going to put our money was on subscription billing. So we were going to turn this free service into a paid service, and we were going to charge everybody um, between um, 5 and, and, and $50 a month for, for using what we were offering. Uh, and so we had to rapidly provide, come up with a subscription billing solution. Uh, so we integrated with a third party provider. Um, we actually used Zora. And um, the, uh, we, we, uh, my team came in, so, so I, was, I was running the team. Stefan and Pierre were both part of it. And um, we, we kind of took over shortly after the integration had completed. And we ran with Zora for about a year. And um, at the end of the year, we decided we needed to write our own billing system. So let me explain a little bit about why. Uh, the, the nature of our service was that we had um, three different clients. The e-commerce site that was actually where you would buy a Ning product, um, the, the Ning product itself, and our internal admin tools. So all of those pieces required some interaction with the billing system to get information in and out about what was going on. Um, and so obviously we didn't want them all to connect across the big wide internet, so we introduced a proxy server in between. Uh, seemed like a good idea. It could help us with a bit of resilience if there were any outages. Um, but what started happening was we, we found that this provider didn't actually meet all our requirements for business logic. There were little pieces missing here and there. None of them seemed like a big deal at the time, so we started adding wrappers around our functionality, putting more and more business logic into the proxy service. Um, the plan that I had for this was that what we were going to do was ultimately convince Zora to implement these things the way we'd done them, and then re you know, unwind ours and, and replace it with theirs. Um, <clears throat> what, what happened was that this turned out to be a very, very painful way to try and do things because uh, we ended up with a lot of state in the proxy service and a lot of state obviously return, remaining in, in, Bella, in, in, uh, in Zora. And we ended up with this uh, situation where it was very easy for the two systems to get out of sync. One system would end up thinking something was one way, one, the other system would end up thinking it was another way. And, um, you know, an example would be uh, cancellations. We wanted to cancel a subscription. Sometimes Zora will, will disallow a cancellation for business rules. And we weren't able to necessarily anticipate all of the business rules that would lead to that situation. And so we got into a situation where we'd trigger a cancellation and it would fail. And at that point, it, I mean, what do you do, right? Do you roll back? Do you try and roll back the cancellation? Do you... Uh, proceed with the cancellation here and, and, and leave us in a split brain state. Um, and so we faced those kind of problems and, and truly working through them became a very painful experience. I've got an example on the next slide of a piece of business logic that was, it, it seems like it's like an obvious thing. Like it would be so easy to fix this. Why, why would this cause these kind of problems? But um, we, we didn't have a, 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 a trial uh, implemented on our third-party system that worked for us. The, the solution they offered was um, you could start it, you could buy a subscription now, and you could start it in 30 days' time. So it seems reasonable. It gives you the right billing. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that we have three clients, and they need to know what a subscription is right now. What kind of subscription does that user have today? Well, what we're going to have to do is we're going to write business logic that's going to be replicated three times that's so going to have to call a cloud provider and say, oh, okay, what's the subscription state? And then realize that there's a subscription in the future between now and 30 days from now and therefore deduce that we must be in a trial state 
And you see where I'm going with this, right? It doesn't work. So we had to build our own idea of a trial subscription. But now we have a bunch of logic here. We've got to keep track of the fact we have a trial and a paid subscription, two subscriptions. This one needs to be canceled at this point here. This one needs to be started at this point here. If we upgrade, we now have two subscriptions that need to be upgraded. If we downgrade, we've got... And so it goes on. And so we found ourselves building more and more of this kind of wrapper business logic with all these additional features, and it became very, very painful. And so at the end of about a year, we reached the decision um, for Ning that it made sense to embark on a project to build this ourselves. Uh, and we had a bunch of requirements that we wanted to solve as part of that process, including the ability to be able to add business logic. And part of the problem here is the business logic we were adding was tightly coupled to the billing system, but it was going over this thin API and via a, an internet connection. And so we wanted a system that it was easy to add new business logic to via some kind of plug-in capabilities that allowed you to tightly couple new pieces of business logic because we felt it was inevitable that you were going to run out of, um, you know, you were never going to be able to anticipate with a single system all the business logic requirements of all the different subscription systems that people would want to build. And so that's really the, the genesis of, um, of what, we, what we started from. And uh, I'll hand over now to Stefan, who's going to say a little bit more about the system and how it works. Thank you, Martin. So Martin just told us the why, right? Why we decided to uh, build Kill Bill. So I will tell you a little bit of what it is. So what is Kill Bill? So Kill Bill is a platform to build billing and payment systems. So it's not a generic platform. It's not your JBoss. It's just a specific platform for that use case. Also, when you, when, you, when you start comparing systems, you know, often you look at the marketing slides of people having billing systems, and you see these charts with these columns, and you have billing system one, two, three, and you have 256 features, and this one is green, 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 red, red, red. And we could do that and compare ourselves, but I think the main difference really for us is not in terms of the features. It's, it's the model that we adopted. So for one thing, we decided to go open source. There are two main drivers for that. One, uh, when you think about all the billing use cases that you can have, all the catalogs, you know, we talked about trials. Uh, you can talk about billing in advance, in arrear. You can talk about all the cancellation policies. All that stuff, when you want to start testing, and all the usage model, when you want to start testing all that, the matrix is huge. So, open source is great for that because we have all you guys in that room that will do the testing for us and report the bugs. Thank you. So, that's one reason. The second one really is about the architecture. And we didn't know that first. So, when we decided to go open source, we had different reasons. But the one that we discovered later was that when you start to go open source and you really want to do a good job about it, you have to make your code as clean as possible because you can't have your own business logic in your system. You can't have your Groupon-specific code. You can't have your Ning-specific code. You need to abstract it. You need to have that code modular. And when you look back and you look at what we built, I think that's where we did a good job. Open data. So the open data, really what it means is owning your data. So we learned from experience what Martin described earlier, that uh, with the system that we had, that little proxy in front of the cloud provider, we learned that uh, when your exec come back to you and ask you for numbers, if you don't have the data, it's very hard to give the numbers. So we started to build at the time, we built like this complicated ETL system that would synchronize the data every night, but of course, it would get broken, never work. Frustration happens, exec not happy, nobody's happy. So by actually embracing that and, and owning your billing system, you have your own data and all, and all those problems suddenly disappear. The last bullet is the open architecture. It's linked 
to the open source in a way what I described with the modularity and the cleanliness of the code. So now you have this platform that is generic, but by definition, if it's generic, it's not going to fit your specific need. So we need something else on top of it. We need a way to, to tweak that system so that from a generic system, it becomes the system that you want. And that thing is what we call open architecture. That works. Okay, so that's that. Next slide. So that is a logical view of what the system looks like. So we have uh, three different logical layers. One is what we call the platform, and I will describe a little bit later what it is. Uh, one of the things that it does is all the life cycle. So initializing, starting, stopping, all what we call the core services. The core services are really the bulk of the payment and billing code, right? So it's account management, invoicing, payments, dunning, everything. And then on top of it, we have the plugins. So plugins could be plugins that we wrote ourselves because we think they can be some kind of generic plugins. For instance, integrate, integration with payment gateways or things like that. Or they could be the place where you, where you have your own custom business logic to tweak that system in the direction that you want. Platform. So, uh, one of the things that is different in Kill Bill is the, is the model what we, that we decided to take. Uh, so, when, 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 you, when you think of billing system, often they are batch oriented, right? So, what happens is you have to uh, let's say schedule every six hours, 12 hours, every day, you have to schedule the invoicing, right? So the system will go through all the accounts and start generating invoicing. In our case, what we wanted to do is something that is more reactive. So we, ha we built an event-based system, which means every time there is a change in the system, the system will emit an event and the whole system will be aware of it. And not only that, but we build it in a, in a way that we have strong semantics. So what do I mean by strong semantics? What I mean really is that every time you persist your state on disk, you're guaranteed that an event will be generated. So you never end up in that situation where, oh, I'm not sure, maybe the event is missing. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Another feature is the multi-tenancy. So that multi-tenancy means really that you can have uh, multiple customers uh, running on the same deployment. So that's also in the platform because every single piece of the system has to be aware of which tenant uh, the operation is, is dealing with at the time. Another thing that we built, which is really specific to billing and payment, is all the audit, audit trail and history. So when you, when you do an operation, you want to know who did it, why, and when. So all that stuff has been abstracted so that each of these core services I was mentioning before uh, doesn't have to do extra work, and automatically we save that. And then one more, one more thing I want to say about that platform is uh, something that we use extensively for the test, which is having a global clock. So what it really means is that the system has its own view of time. Obviously, for production, the time is really the time in which we are, and, it, and it, you don't want to tweak it. But when you, when you want to run some tests, so for instance, let's say, you want to cancel a subscription in the future, end of term. How do you test something like that? So in our case, it's fairly easy. You write a little test which creates the subscription, then cancels it in the future, then you, you move the clock, so you tell the system, hey, I'm not here, I'm here, and then you just wait and see what happens. 
As I said, we are event-based, so an event will be generated for that cancellation, and you can verify that it's happening. Oops. Core services. So those, each of these cute little box here is a separate module, separate jar, and it exports its own API. There is a hierarchy here, so it goes from the bottom to the top. And so what we did for the communication between the modules is we designed a, a way in, in order to prevent having too much coupling, right? Where, where each box calls the next and you start to have like this mesh of things calling each other. So what we did here is we have a flow of event that starts from the bottom and goes to the top. And then each of those box can call the box below them in terms of API call to retrieve the state or change the state of the system. So for instance, let's say somebody creates a subscri subscription. So the entitlement system will be notified. It will, it will send an event, say, hey, there is a new, there is a new subscription in the system. The invoice system here will listen to all the entitlement notifications and will react to it. It will attempt to create an invoice by just fetching the state of the account, entitlement, and the catalog and try to compute that invoice. If indeed there is a new invoice, it, the same will happen now. The invoice system will now generate an event on the bus and then this time the payment system, which listens to the invoice module, will now get the information that a new invoice was there and will react to the invoice and make the payment. And the story continues, same thing for the Dunning or overdue box. So we talked a little bit about the platform, we talked about the core services, and then the last layer is the plugin. So what is a plugin? So a plugin really what it means is it's a piece of code that plugs in and it plugs in to one of the core service using what we call a plugin API. So we have multiple plugin APIs. So for instance, we have a payment plugin API, we have invoice plugin APIs, and so what happens here is that those kinds of plugins can extend the functionality of that core service. For instance, for the payment subsystem, let's say you want to do an integration with some gateway, payment gateway or payment processor. So you can write your own little plugin and, and write all the code that integrates with the gateway. So in a way you become the extension of the payment system. So those plugins sit at the top of the chain. So they have access to all the system events, which means that they know everything which is happening in the system. They have access to all the APIs, which means they can retrieve the state of any object and change the state as well. We also give them a handle to the database. So if you want to, to store your own state to do something a little bit more involved in your plugin, you can do that. And we also give them the ability to export their own endpoints. Okay, so we talked about Kill Bill, uh, the server, right? So now there is a little world around it. Uh, so we have client libraries. Uh, we have some in Ruby, Java, and we started the work in other languages, but it's becoming hard with two guys to just do every single language on Earth. Uh, we have about 30 plugins. We also built our package manager, because the deployment, when now you want to deploy Kill Bill, which is a server with a set of plugins, uh, becomes a little bit difficult if you do it by hand. So we have a tool that is called KPM, Kill Bill Package Manager, where you can have a configuration and basically it's going to install everything you need. 
And of course, we have a UI, so we have an administration UI that your support team can use, uh, which is fairly complete. Uh, you can obviously see the state of every single object in the system and do a lot of the operations that you would expect to do. Account creation, subscription creation, change plan, all the payment, refund, invoice item adjustments. Uh, we, that UI also has the capability to have a role-based access. So if you have different groups of people in your team, they can have different roles. And then finally, we also have analytics dashboards which work uh, in conjunction with a plugin that we wrote, which is the analytics plugin. Still works in the back? Good. So Stefan talked to you about Kill Bill, the open source project, the open source product uh, but how does Groupon, a publicly traded company with over 8 billion in gross billing a year, how such a big company can use the open source project uh, to handle all their payment information and all their financial data? I'm actually pleased to say they're using a very small wrapper around the, um, the project. We are using Maven to pull the binaries from Maven Central. These are the exact same binaries that we publish or we use in other projects, and these would be the binaries that you would be using uh, when you start using Kill Bill. The wrapper bundles a little bit of spatial sauce on it, which is very, very minimal. Not a lot of business logic, it's mainly a health check, which is the standard health check that all of the group on load balancer expect. And we also have a small API translation layer, which mainly helps us migrate from uh, legacy Groupon systems. But that's it. Uh, we, can, we can say that Groupon is pretty much using the open source project as is. We do fall under compliance, however. Uh, first of all, SOX compliance. So this, this wrapper, JKB, uh, is under SOX compliance. While we can make modification to the code, uh, we need adult supervision in order to push the code to production. And that means uh, there's a whole process we need to go through. Release engineering has to be involved. Uh, paperwork has to be signed, etc., etc. That being said, the zones, the, the, um, the VMs are not under PCI compliance. Groupon has been actually very smart in how they design their PCI infrastru infrastructure. They use what we call a proxy tokenizer at the edge of the data center. This means that every request coming in with a credit card number is tokenized. This token is then passed to downstream services, including Kill Bill, and this token is pretty much useless uh, without, uh, without the PCI environment, which means we can easily leak it to the, to the log. We don't have to worry too much about it. This is really the same um, tokenization mechanism you would be using if you were to be using a, a Stripe, a Braintree, et cetera. In terms of stack, it's a, it's a fin, fairly standard Java stack. They're using uh, Apache Tomcat, straight Apache Tomcat, Java 1.8, usually with four gigs of heap, which is uh, plenty for, for running a few plugins. We often have the question coming about, what about performance? How many payments per second can I do with Kill Bill? It's a very hard question to answer in the, in the abstract. However, we've done a lot of performance testing at Groupon, and we've ben benchmarked our system to be able to process between 10 to 100 payments per second at peak. So the, the Java stack, Apache Tomcat uh, Java, is, is able to handle thousands and thousands of requests uh, that's what your typical web server would do. Remember, we're talking about payments. A uh, lot of states, a um, lot of transactions, often high latency because uh, we're integra integrating with payment gateways. Uh, so this 10 to 100 number, while it seems small, is fairly high if you um, put dollar numbers associated to it. 
If you're running JRuby, Stefan mentioned that we support uh, different types of plugin, including uh, JRuby plugins, you will have a little bit of overhead. And Groupon uh, uses a lot, actually, of, uh, of JRuby plugins. And uh, we've actually been very, very uh, lucky to have somebody helping us on that side of the equation, of the performance equation. His name is Carol Busek, who you probably know from the JRuby and the Active Record community. Uh, over the past few months, he's ha he has actually been running thousands and thousands of tests on EC2 and RDS against Stripe, against Lytle, against Cybersource to understand um, the request patterns that, um, that he sees in the, in the JVM itself, in JRuby, or in the, in the gems we are using. He's publishing all these findings on his uh, public GitHub repository, so you can take a look. Uh, the results are still raw, however, and I'm hoping he will come up with uh, either a paper or a blog post that will summarize his findings, the bug he has found maybe in the, in, in the stack, and tell us which are the magic flags we should be using for the JVM, for instance. Stefan mentioned KPM, which is our uh, the Kill Bill Package Manager, which we use in the open source to... Uh, to deploy Kill Bill and its plugins. Groupon uses KPM as well. Uh, and often when, when we do a re new release of Kill Bill or we have new plugins we want to deploy, all we need to do really is update tell KPM about it and roll the hosts, the hosts and KPM will take care of the rest. In the open source, we also use Docker. We provide Docker images that are actually just wrapper around KPM. Uh, if you're starting a, a project today, we encourage you to use Docker. We're probably a little bit biased towards French engineering, but it's a, it's a very good tool to use. Um, that being said, Groupon is not quite ready yet to, um, to use uh, Docker. Some teams are experimenting with it. Uh, but as soon as they are, we'll be migrating their, um, their deployment system to Docker as well. So we're going to discuss now a little bit about the use cases that we have of Kill Bill at Groupon. So the first one is uh, subscription billing. So there are already quite a few teams in, in Groupon that are invoicing their customers using subscriptions. They have different solutions to do it. They rely on third-party cloud offering. And each of those is done in its own way, own fashion. We also have a lot of teams, projects, that would like to experiment by doing subscription billing to see how it works, whether is it a good strategy. But the problem is the time to market to do that is too high. So often it just doesn't happen. And then another thing that we noticed around subscription billing is that in some cases we have bad customer experience. So in one case, for instance, we have uh, customers for a given project that have to enter their credit card twice. One for the cloud offering that takes care of the subscriptions and another time for Groupon to have the credit card. And then finally, uh, all that there is a cost around it each time. Each of these team that has to integrate with third-party cloud offering has to pay the price for it. So what we decided to do is create something that we call internally subscription as a service, which is basically a deployment of Kill Bill using the multi-tenancy feature that we have. The way it looks is that each team will belong to one tenant and will have the ability to upload its own catalog, its own overdue configuration, its own invoice templates if needed. We also recently worked on our admin UI and our analytics dashboard, so those are now also fully multi-tenant. So we now have the full story for that. 
we do have a few features that are left that we are still working on. Uh, we still have some work around tax plugins. Each team has different needs, and so it's getting interesting. Uh, some UI enhancements, and we are thinking of different usage billing models. So we support some of the usage billing model, but as you probably know, there are a lot of ways of doing usage billing. Another use case is about global payments. You may have heard the term one playbook that Groupon uses uh, publicly to refer to the project which is uh, to streamline its footprint, its operations across the world. As you probably know, Groupon grew very rapidly by doing lots of acquisition and across various countries and nations. Uh, and uh, this led to integration challenges. The one playbook is the um, answer to solving these challenges. We've been working on that uh, with Groupon on the payment side of things, and Kill Bill is the one playbook answer uh, to these integration challenges. So what, does it, what, what is it going to look like? Kill Bill is being deployed across all regions, APAC, EMEA, North and Latin America, and individual teams will develop their own plugins to talk their, to their individual payment providers uh, or acquirers uh, or payment gateways. This means Groupon really will have a single API to call to trigger any type of payment, regardless of the type of payment method, regardless of the country, etc. I'm listing uh, some numbers here to show you the, the complexity of, um, of the projects in terms of designing an API that would be flexible enough to support all of these use cases. To give you an example, let's talk a little bit about Latin America. Uh, it's, uh, we're fairly advanced in rolling out that project and we had some challenging along the, the way when looking at the type of payment method which were actually very popular over there and we needed to support. You may know that there are a lot of un and underbank in Latin America, meaning people do not have access to credit or debit card. So if you don't have a credit card, how do you pay online? Well, you pay by cash. If you don't know how that works, it usually involves printing a voucher. So you go to Groupon.com. In the checkout flow, you will, uh, you will be prompted with a, with a voucher. You print the voucher. You go, say, to your next door 7-Eleven. You pay by cash, and when the cashier scans the barcodes, a notification is sent back to Kill Bill via the gateway, notifying that the uh, payment is successful. So this is very asynchronous model, very different from your regular auth capture, um, and we had to, uh, to work with that. In case you're interested in, uh, in cash-based payment method, take a look at the Boleto in Brazil, the Baloto in Colombia, uh, or at the 7-Eleven uh, vouchers. Going on with Latin America, how does it look like? The entire region has only two single in instances of Kill Bill talking to a shared MySQL database behind a load balancer, and that's it. The, the hard part has been done. We've deployed Kill Bill, we've trained the teams on how to write their own plugins, and all that, that needs to be done now is execute on the plan, write the plugins needed for each country, update Kill Bill, migrate the, um, the, the payment, route the payment from the old infrastructure to Kill Bill, and off we go. I'm listing a few of the plugins here. There are many, many, mores, uh, in, in many, many more in the works. Uh, just to name a few, SafetyPay, WebPay, and Mercado, Mercado Pago, just in Latin America. So taking a step back at the One Playbook initiative, uh, what does Kill Bill give to Groupon be, be, beside the single API I talked to you about? We believe our solution now gives them more flexibility compared to what they have before. 
In the previous slide, you may have noticed a certify the, um, uh, a, we had a plugin for a certify for certain countries in Latin America. This plugin is generic. It's a plugin for a certify. It does, it's not a plugin for a certify in Latin America. This means that the plugin that is now available uh, in Latin America is available everywhere in the world. And the Japan team tomorrow, if they wanted to use a certify for their fraud detection, um, uh, the credit card fraud detection, they could use the plugin right away. So it really lowers the time to market and distribute the, word, the work across the world. Additionally, these plugins uh, are pretty much vendor agnostic when it comes to Kill Bill. Kill Bill knows that there are plugins running doing fraud detection, but it doesn't know it's in a certified uh, fraud detection plugin. This means Groupon can now play a little bit with other vendors very easily. We've actually been working recently with a European-based company called Feedzai, and they have a unique approach with, um, towards um, fraud detection. Unlike traditional systems or vendors, they're not, um, their decisions are based on machine learning, data science, and not rules, static rules. And it would be very easy tomorrow for Groupon to say, hey, let's take 100,000 transactions in Brazil, route it to a certify, and Feedzai compare the results and make a decision whether one solution is more effective compared to the other, maybe depending on the country, maybe depending on the payment method, etc. I mentioned the, the payments flow, the, the cash-based payment methods. There are many more flows that we, we've been working on to support. Uh, we've been work, working with the Russian team to support the SMS-based flow um, using dumb phones. Uh, we've, of course, support uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and um, any type of payment flow really you can think of, uh, we're pretty confident we've got it covered. And finally, we now support payment routing. This means that at runtime, you can decide to shift traffic from one gateway to the other. This was actually handy uh, while rolling out certain countries in Latin America because the existing infrastructure was integrating with a legacy provider. We knew the provider was going away or at least this specific API for this specific payment method but we didn't quite know what the new API would look like. So we were wondering, what should we do? Should we write a plugin just for uh, maybe Q1 and then wait to write the next plugin when the new API comes, uh, comes along? Or should we halt the migration for this country? What should we do? Luckily, we had the ADN plugin. And ADN still supports that legacy provider for that legacy payment method. This means that we decided to shift the, the traffic for that specific payment method to ADN, which gave us some time to think about what we want to do moving forward. In terms of roadmap, um, we have three goals for, uh, for this year. First of all, we need to execute on the plan. Uh, I said the hard part is down, it's just a matter of the executing it. And I'm actually quite happy to say it's going very well so far. We had our first meeting with Japan two weeks ago, I believe. And usually the, the meeting goes like this. Hi, we're Kill Bill. This is what we do. This is the API you're going to integrate with. This is how you write a plugin. This is how you test it. Do you have any question? Off you go, and we'll talk to you a little bit later. And the meeting was very, very different. They came, uh, they came to us and said, Yep, we have our first plugin already. Can you code review it? So that was very, very exciting because it meant we are not blockers anymore. Teams everywhere in the world can work independently without us. They don't need to talk to us. We just have to make sure the space layers, the space platform uh, is up and running and fit their needs. I also want to uh, highlight that we've been working with uh, Groupon Legal uh, around all these plugins, and we've had approval to op open source all of them. So that means all of this work that is being done in parallel across the world will be in GitHub sometime this year, so you're going to be able to benefit from. 
Another goal for, uh, for us for this year is, is intelligent routing. I mentioned payment routing, being able to shift traffic from one provider to the other, but we can do more intelligent things. So what does it mean? We can detect at runtime if a payment gateway is slowing down or if they have an outage, and instead of failing payment, just route it to another provider. Let's say Chase Payment Tech is being slow, they have a maintenance or something is up. We route it to Ventiv or Heartland, some, somebody else, uh, for, for, for the time of the outage. We can also lower costs. Um, transaction pricing is very complicated, com complicated as you probably know, and uh, it's gonna depend on the type of transaction, on the type of payment method. If we know what Groupon pays for all of the provider, for all the payment method, we can choose at runtime which provider to use in order to lower costs. This is, this is something we're gonna take a look at as, as well during the year. And finally, we want to unify the, the chargeback story. Kill Bill already has an API to record chargebacks. Uh, if you've lost one, you can enter it in the system. Invoice balance will be updated. Financial reports uh, will have the information. That's great. But we can do better. A chargeback really has a life cycle. It begins when uh, a customer contacts its uh, issuer, contests a charge, and then there's a lot of back and forth between the merchant, the acquirer, the issuer, a lot of paperwork being filled. And um, just all of the data which is available in, in the vendors, we want to be able to bring it more sm smoothly inside Kill Bill and have more insights in the chargeback uh, lifecycle. So this is something we're going to take a look at as well. Um, either we're going to do it ourselves or we're going to look at vendors which help um, uh, in, that, uh, in that area, such as, uh, as you may know, chargeback.com. So we've learned tonight a little bit on why we decided to create Kill Bill. That's what Martin discussed first. Then we took a look at what Kill Bill is and a little bit of the internals, you know, the flow of events and all that, the layers. And then we've looked at two uh, different use cases that we have of Kill Bill at Groupon, right? The subscription case and the global payment. So, as you may know, choosing a billing and payment solution is not a light decision because it really sits at the heart of your company. When you think about it, your marketing department will probably want to run some A-B testing, funnel optimization, and the like. Your finance department will want to have the latest numbers to do all the reports. Your exec team will want to also have numbers to understand are we doing well, uh, what happened with that feature that we did last week, uh, was it good? And then obviously your engineering team, uh, it has to integrate with that system and, and make that connection with the rest of your system. So we spent about four years working on that project. I think we reached a point where the system is mature we actually have some validation of that uh, claim by running it in Groupon, Ning, and actually other uh, startup that contacted us that started to use it in production. We've also seen the community grow. So we start to see more and more exchanges and mailing lists, uh, bug reports, obviously, and actually a lot of talks that happen outside of the mailing list. So basically all that is for you to use if you want it. And uh, what I want to tell you tonight is that we are very excited to see what kind of use case you come up with, see if our, support, our system supports it. And also we are eager to work with your teams.
So if you guys have any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question around if I want to <coughs> if I want to run this uh, Kill Bill, uh, just a slice of Kill Bill, like uh, say for example the entitlement plugin alone, or the entitlement service alone, um, is that possible, or do I have to run the whole thing for for me to use it? Um. So it depends what you mean by the whole thing. So uh, the whole thing in the sense the payment, the invoice, um, all the, the complete stack. Like, do I have to use all of them together, or can I use just the subscription portion of it? So you can use the. So you you can use just pieces of it. So actually, okay. what Pierre described with the payment platform is one of one of those cases. In the payment case, when we do the global payments at Groupon. There's no such thing as invoicing, subscriptions. So it's only about the payment aspect. So we have specific APIs for that. So I wouldn't claim that you can do any combinations you want, okay. but there are certain kinds of profile that you can do where you don't need the whole stack. Okay. Thank you. you want to add something? Or? I have two questions. Um, one would be um, around cross-border transactions um, and interfacing with the APIs that kind of handle those things. And maybe, you know, you talked about interfacing with Latin American countries and the vouchers at 7-Eleven, but I'm interested in, like, what what were the challenges in, in connecting with those APIs that sort of solve that for you? And then also PCI standards. What were the challenges around those standardizations? <laughs> uh, okay, so on the first one, I'm going to try to remember them all. Uh, on the first one, really, the, the the integration that you mentioned, right, with a, with a different uh, providers across the world. So that that's a lot of what Pierre touched, right? So really, for us, what it means is that if you want to go somewhere else, different country where they have a potentially different flow of, of payments, um, you're going to have to find, uh, in our case, you're going to have to find payment gateways, payment processors with which you can interact with. What we provide is the single API that your business can use all the time, and the flows, all those flows, uh, we looked at them, so they are, they are now supported, so it's a matter to make that connection with that specific provider. Were you kind of cherry picking APIs and finding different services that work for you as, as far as that goes? Oh, for us cross board, you mean? So let me let me clarify what I think you're asking. Okay. You, you're talking about situations where I have a business in, uh, let's say, UK, and I am selling to uh, customers in France yep. and possibly shipping goods. So there's all kinds of rules and tax constraints and special VAT rules and all that, that come into play. And I think for those kind of situations, we don't have any support today. Um, it, it is something that Groupon is concerned about, and so it's possible that at some point in the future we, we may, it may land to Kill Bill, but it's handled by other aspects of the Groupon business logic today. Um, I think it would be something that is a good candidate for a plugin, but um, you know, but it does. But such a plugin doesn't exist today. Regarding the uh, the um, challenges with a provider, it's mainly around flakiness of their APIs and and lack of test environments. What if we, what we've seen is. Uh, for the voucher thing, most of them will expect you to go physically to a store to test your integration. They don't have mocks. They don't have fake notification thing. So that, that has been one, one struggle. Uh, depending on your size, you can push back a little bit on them, uh, but something to be concerned. And the API in general are, uh, with the infrastructure can be very flaky. Uh, one last question. Yeah. Where do you get Kill Bill from? Where's the name from? Wow, that's the hardest question. 
Uh, okay, so when we started the project, we had to find a name, obviously. It's always a tough choice. And uh, we like uh, Tarantino movies, <laughs> I guess, yeah. Uh, the other part of that is that we were really, uh, at the time, we were really doing billing, and so it's a bit of a play of word with uh, the billing aspect. Hello, thank you. Looks good. I heard you mention that Groupon tokenizes credit card account numbers, for example, before passing them in, so that way you could feel free to log them and such. But if that's the case, how do you de-tokenize them to send them to a cyber source, for example? How does that conversion get back made? Yeah, so we, we, we missed the last part. So there is a tokenization aspect. So right when the requests come in, the request goes through, through a specific proxy, which does the tokenization. And then when the request comes back, the request goes back to the detokenizer, de which does the opposite operation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have like technical questions. Um, to, first one is like, you know, um, regarding like the plugins, you know, when you develop the plugins, I'm assuming you know, sometimes we'll be developing in Java, maybe other languages also. So once you have your plugins and then like, you know, when you deploy the, the plugins inside the Java virtual machine in Tomcat, uh, does that affect like, you know, the performance of performance or the stability of the virtual machine? You know, because you're using like different languages and then you're deploying them inside the Java. So your question is around stability? Yeah, stability of the JVM because of the because of the plugin development and then like So the plugin because it's a different language or yeah, yeah, it's a different So I mean it's a typical uh, running JRuby on Java or running Jiten on Java, it has nothing really to do with plugins, right? Uh, it's true that the the JVM supports such languages, but it's also true that your code runs better when it's all native, right? So if you only run Java, it runs better. Uh, we've, we've seen issues, uh, that's what Pierre mentioned. We've, we've started to work with uh, an engineer from uh, the, the JRuby community. Uh, there are all kinds of flags that you can use, uh, whether you want the, the JVM to do a bunch of things. And so he, he's been trying all that, and, and, and we are trying to compute the result to understand the best way to, to run it. Interestingly enough, do not use Invoke Dynamic. Uh, we've seen lots of problems under high load. Uh, so at Groupon, we're turning Invoke Dynamic off uh, in production. Uh, and I have like uh, more like a, on the event mechanism, like you know event handling for the system. Uh, what are you? How are you implementing the event handling? Is it like some sort of like a JMS from the you know and like message queue that kind of thing? Uh, okay, so um, so we wanted to do events, right, because of the nature of the system. We looked around, and uh, there were, we couldn't find something that we really, li really liked. There are two reasons for it. One, we wanted to have that, uh, that atomicity, right, between uh, writing state on disk and sending your event, we wanted to have that uh, atomic, in the sense that you can't have one without the other. So what we did here is we basically are using the, I don't know if you're familiar with Guava, the Google collections, they have a bus event. So we reused their, their bus events, which is in-memory bus event, but we tweaked it a little bit. So normally what happens is when you post, there, there is two sides of the bus event, right? There is one side that posts the events, and then there is the other side that is dispatching the events. So we cut that in two. So for us, really posting an event is writing in the database, which means that because now it's writing in the database, you can have atomicity because you can do that in the same transaction in which you're saving your state. So that's one side of it. Then there is the delivery of the event. So the delivery of the event, we basically wrote something that looks like a blocking queue on top of MySQL. So as we get something inserted in MySQL, a new event, uh, it, it acts as if it was a blocking queue and we get notified and we fetch that event and dispatch it. 
So, so we cut it in two. It was the least worst of all the framework that we found. Uh, it gives us also some flexibility in terms of uh, more plugins. If any OSGI bundle can run alongside Kill Bill, and we do run some of the standard Felix logging and all the Felix stuff, if you're familiar with it, we run these bundles as well. Uh, so while you can write your own um, Kill Bill plugins, you can also write uh, standard OSGI bundles or even uh, just drop any OSGI bundle in it and it should work. Just one more thing on that. So uh, really what the OSGI gives you is the ability to uh, separate uh, your, your, your plugins in terms of classes, right? So I, I can, for instance, have two different plugins that use two different versions of the same library. If you don't have that mechanism, then you end up in a dependency mess. So that's the main thing it gives you. It's not a lot, but it's actually pretty good. So I have a few questions. Uh, you say you have one API, and then uh, we use that API, and then internally you have like multiple payment gateways and payment processes. Uh, how do I test this? Like you have 59 payment processes and say 100 uh, payment gateways. How does the test environment work? Usually the trick is to test your plugin as is. Forget Kill Bill, just write the, the plugin and make sure your integration with the gateway works right. Integration tests, again, they're sandbox, um, maybe run some tests in production, just that little piece without Kill Bill. And then you can do more integra integration testing inside, with, with, inside Kill Bill, so you test the end-to-end -end flow. But what the teams usually do when they roll out country by country is write the plugin, make sure the plugin works outside Kill Bill, and then integrate with Kill Bill. It, it, it is the, the, the testing, definitely. I see. Okay. So do you have like a breakdown, at least for like Groupon, uh, how many payment funding sources you guys accept right now? How many? Uh, like funding sources that, you know, like say Bitcoin, Bank. Mm. ACH, Do you have a number? <laughs> it's a lot of plugins. Uh, unsure, sorry. So it's, it's like a huge list. It's a big list, but uh, yeah, I don't have the numbers on top of my head. So like for chargebacks and stuff like that, like for various different funding sources, do you follow like different mechanisms? Currently, we don't handle the chargeback. Uh, that's what we want to do uh, for Groupon. Um, chargeback is handled by various teams. There's a lot of, of manual reconciliation involved for the finance, deal, finance teams to have a, a decent report. And that's something we want to tackle this year, to take care of the chargeback for them by downloading the files from the processor or uh, getting the lifecycle information and then producing one standard report for finance. But we're not involved with that yet, unfortunately. I see. Okay, got it. So my last question is, like in quite a few of your slides, you have this Coyote and Roadrunner and stuff like that. <laughs> I have no idea why you use that. Uh, it's just to, it's a payment meetup. Payment is now, it's always serious, so we want to light up the mood a little bit. Okay. I hope it worked. <laughs> but I don't know, what, do you, what what's the meaning of Coyote and Roadrunner there? <laughs> You remember the uh, the cartoons, right? We're watching. Oh no, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I worked with uh, PayPal and Stripe. You know, like I'm familiar with architects on the back end also. Um, you know, like like the way you mentioned about the unit handling. Uh, what is there a is there a point where like you know. You know, this is the event that happened. You know, I subscribe to that thing and you notify me, right? So, is that, I mean, is there a way you, like, saying, you know, this is done, or like, you know, like the way uh, PayPal and Stripe has, like, some sort of, like, a webhooks, you know? In other words, like, 
like like the transaction is over after that like you know, somebody can't contest like you know, there is a fraud involved like you know blah 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 kind of there there are two mechanisms if you're writing a plugin you can subscribe to the bus and okay. you can have encode uh, events but we also private uh, provide uh, webhooks uh, PayPal IPN or the Bitcoin IPN um, HTTP webhooks or the regularly push notifications these type of things we have it as well you can listen to Anything that's happening in the system. So, in other words, like you know, each module is going to register for that particular event. As it as that event happens, like you know, then you will be getting notified. Basically. Yeah. Oh. Last one. So we know of a few companies running in production. Uh, I'm not sure, however, we can... Um, we have one in Poland that we can uh, tell you because they've agreed to put the logo on our website. Uh, we, we have others, but again, I'm not sure we're supposed to, to give you the... Uh, they're mainly SaaS businesses uh, with usage models or the kind of usage that Ning needs, um, subscriptions, basically. B2C, yeah. yeah. Do you foresee any problems if you were I'm sure you will have specific use cases that we haven't thought of, but you can write a plugin. <laughs> All right, last one. Actually, or how abstract your app from database, and what do you think is how hard, easy, impactful will be running different database platforms? Not hard at all. Actually, we know at least three companies who have contacted us for Postgres PostgreSQL support, and if they're going in production with it, they will uh, implement the PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL part. Uh, it's, we're not using many of the MySQL features. Our database stack is very, very simple. We do inserts, delete, and that's pretty much it. Uh, but we do rely on two features of MySQL. One is uh, the lock, and one in the DDL is the auto-increment. But both features could be uh, are available in um, Postgres. Uh, it's just a matter of implementing them. We have nice interfaces. You can just uh, It's just a matter of writing them. And uh, all our tests run also in H2. So the model that we're not relying on MySQL specific feature is proven at least in the, in the test suite. All right, thanks for coming, guys. We can stay a while. Well.